Good morning, everybody. My name is Ignacio Ramirez. I'll be your moderator for this morning's session. And welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school and it is not a church. And neither are we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. Now, this school is a result of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kennelly in the state of Ohio in the year 1931 and established schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Our type pattern workshop was established in February 2021. Now, in these schools, we use and teach by the true and original names and titles for the Heavenly Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has also been improperly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know that each Lord must have a name. Each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce a sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name for our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in his pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son. A super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the self same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading a preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because... It is Yahweh's pattern. Now, after Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern 
in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in the school to prove that everything in the universe moves and operates according to the structure and function of the threefold tabernacle pattern and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the 10 aims of school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, or Satan, and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And the eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan, speak the truth. This morning we have prayer by Dr. Uh, Chris, Christopher Williams. Our scripture lesson is Matthew the 20th chapter, and our scripture reading will be Dr. Annette Ramirez. And we have, we have a selection of music after the prayer. Good morning, class. Good morning. Let us borrow our hearts and minds in a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Yahweh, we thank you once again for allowing us to assemble ourselves here to learn more about your purpose, pattern, and plan. We continue to ask for, for, for the power to sojourn on this earth so that you may give us the strength to deal with the trials and tribulations of life and to walk by faith and not by sight. All these blessings and, uh, and, and, and attributes we ask of your only begotten son, Yahshua Messiah. Let us all say, hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Good morning, class. My name is Nanette Ramirez, and I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name versions of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trana. I'll be reading Matthew, the 28th chapter. After the Sabbath was passed, and as the day after the Sabbath began to dawn, came Mary and Magdalene and the other Miriam to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, to keepers did see shake and became a, as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Yahshua, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where Yahshua lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Yahshua met them, saying, Peace be unto you. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Yahshua unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we, sleep, while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him to secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Yahshua had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, even while some doubted. And Yahshua came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. I have read Matthew the 28th chapter. Let us all say hallelujah. Good morning once again. And those of you who are out on uh, Facebook and YouTube and Zoom. Good morning. Uh, I'm just going to go through the seven steps here in the tabernacle pattern, divine tabernacle pattern, which is from heaven itself, and uh, correlate with the, the migratory pattern. Okay, we use these two plates here, and we'll just go through the seven steps, be brief about it, and I'll call the next speaker. Okay, we have seven steps here in this tabernacle pattern. Okay. And we correlate that with the seven steps in the migratory pattern. Okay. First step is the gate that leads into the court around about. Okay. First step, the gate. Second is this brazen altar of sin sacrifice with four horns in the corners, which the high priest placed the blood of the sacrifice on. Two is the brazen labor of water. Here the high priest washed, plus he washed the sacrifice. Four is the door, okay, or the first veil, okay. That the door, when the high priest was anointed, Aaron and his two sons, to officiate in his tabernacle, 
uh, uh, par uh, in uh, the holy place, the most holy place, they had to stand here at the door, and Moses poured the, the cup of holy anointing over, over the heads of the high priest and the two low priests, so that to made them anointed to officiate here. Going through the door, okay, or we uh, use a four principle, 40, zero is no place holy, okay. Now, we enter the fifth step which is the sanctuary itself, or the holy place. There you have the golden lampstand, seven branch lampstand. Here we have the golden table of showbread with 12 loaves on it, golden crown around the table. And the altar of incense, golden altar of incense. All these articles are gold. Okay, there's nine principal vessels in this tabernacle pattern. So we went through six already, okay? So we have we use light, bread, and intercession to explain these uh, 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 principles here. Now, going to the second veil, or the, uh, the sixth step is the second veil. Here you had embroidered uh, angels uh, that were embroidered on the veil inside and out and throughout the inside of the, of the most holy place. Now, the high priest, when he enters here, he takes his, uh, his censer, and he had a, 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 a container of blood which he had to sprinkle. When he went between the two staves, he always had to face her. And we, one thing you got to remember, it was pitch black in here. You couldn't see anything. Okay? So if he made a mistake, that was it for him. But there's two staves sticking out. So when he came through the, the, the veil here, he had to fasten himself start flicking the blood seven times, and also move around the figure eight, okay? So he could come out through the other side. And in here was this threefold configuration of a throne, okay? He had these two uh, cherubims of glory above his mercy seat, okay? They looked like they're facing each other, but what they're doing is witnessing this cloud here, or the Shekinah, when it flashed on the Day of Atonement. Which the high priest came up here three times, once a year, okay, and uh, he presented himself before Yahweh, okay, and uh, if he did everything right, the Shechem and I would flash and he'd come right on out. If not, he had these big old staves with flesh hooks underneath to fish him out of there, okay. So he had this threefold, uh, now you, under the seat is the chest, there the second Tables of stones were placed in there with the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, which Moses collected and put in, in there also, and Aaron's rod that budded, okay, went also in the chest, okay, the throne of Yahweh. Now, correlating with the migratory pattern, the first step would be the door or the entrance to the children of Israel's houses. There, they would take the blood of the sacrifice, okay, and place it on the lentil and the two side posts, and then from the basin that they collected the blood, okay, and they would strike it. Just don't smear it, strike it, okay? And the uh, second step would be uh, the blood from the sacrifice, and they were told to, eat, to roast this uh, lamb. It had to be without spot or blemish, no bones of it supposed to be broken, okay? They're supposed to roast it with fire, and Everybody eats it, okay? Now, if they had some left over, to find somebody else that would have to help them eat it. If not, they would have to put this, uh, the rest remaining on the altar and burn it up, okay? Let nothing remain. They have to eat this thing in haste because they're ready to leave this land of Egypt. That was a Passover, okay? The uh, next speaker could talk about it, or but we're just going through the steps here. Now, the third step, just like the tabernacle, is a labor of water. Here, children of Israel took a three-day journey to the Red Sea, okay? And they followed this phenomenal sight, which was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, okay? It, they led them to and through the Red Sea. Now, that would correlate with the fourth step, the door, okay? Now, there's a, a principle of 
40. So when we go into the store, children of Israel, they stood out here in the wilderness 40 years. Okay, they wandered out here. Now, the cloud, which was light by uh, le- uh, cloud by day and light for night, went and sat upon Mount Sinai to give the children of Israel light. Okay. Also, they murmured for food. They got hungry. They went to Moses and started complaining. They wanted food. So Yahweh Elohim rained down manna from heaven. And they baked it in cakes and they ate it. Okay, they had collected for six days. On the sixth day, they're to, to take a uh, double portion because there wasn't going to be none on the Sabbath day. Because the Sabbath day, there was no work supposed to be done. It was a rest day. Okay? So you have light, bread, manna, and Moses. When they came to Moses, he would go and speak to uh, uh, Joshua in the tent of the tabernacle. Of the tabernacle of the congregation, okay? That's intercession. You have light, bread, intercession. Now you reach the, the, the sixth step here. It would be the Jordan River, just like the second veil here in the tabernacle, okay? There, the, uh, when they took the, uh, the um, altar, of um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, when this cloud went above the, uh, uh, came out of the tabernacle and stood above it, they knew it was ready to move this tabernacle. And it was told to Moses that to choose out men, you can read about that. And they were going to take a journey to and through the River Jordan into the promised land of Canaan's land. But they followed that cloud, that phenomenal cloud, okay, which led them to and through it. Now they ended up in Canaan's land. On Mount Moriah, uh, about 400 years there, they built this temple here, okay? Uh, Solomon's temple. It was a threefold configuration also. It was a porch, sanctuary, and an oracle. Threefold. It was like, uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy says, that it was like a man, it looked like a man sitting on a throne. You had these two chapters on the side of Boaz and, uh, see Owen? Jackin? Jackin. Okay. So it looks like man sitting there with his legs. And then this thing was overlaid with precious stones and gold. It's like this was a overlaid with pure gold. Okay. So it shined just like when the sun at its zenith would hit this. It was just like the sun on earth, you know, because you couldn't even look at it. It's just a reflection, typed in shadow. Okay. So. That's your seven steps here. Simple, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We make the correlations. So that way, we can start to understand how to line up these correlations with these different plates, okay? And uh, it's, a, it's a big help to us when we do our research, okay? And anything else that people come up with out in the world, we have something to compare it with, okay? So that's it for that, and I'll call the next speaker. Next speaker will be Dr. Will Williams. Good morning, class. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here with you to learn more of this great and awesome, colossal, stupendous panoramic vision and revelation given to us by Yahweh our Elohim, who is the resurrected Yahshua Messiah. (coughs) And I've had people ask me why I do that, why I say that every time I get up here. And it's because when I first came to class, that's what was told to me (laughs) about this vision of revelation. Right, and honestly, I don't hear too many people using those kind of words anymore like I used to hear in the past. So I suppose it's Yahweh's way of reminding people what it is that you're facing up here. You know, the magnitude and the, the greatness of, of, of what we have been given. And that uh, what the first speaker went through, 
the, the comparison between the tabernacle pattern and the migratory pattern. That is the key to unlock the vision that is di uh, displayed here on these different charts, what Dr. Kenny drew. And, uh, and you know, I knew about the tabernacle when I was growing up in church. I didn't know whether it was a divine pattern, but it's in the Bible. So that anybody who's ever read the Bible would read about the tabernacle. And it was just a place of worship. But it wasn't until I got here that I learned that it's a divine pattern of the universe. Okay. Maybe I should start off with Hebrews 8 and 1. And then we'll go to yonder uh, jar of numbers. We have to select our topic for the day. Well, specific topic. Our topic is the archetype pattern. That's always going to be the topic in every session that we have, you know. But the thing is, it's, it's the particulars you know, when we get persnickety about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have a Hebrews 8 and 1. Mm -hmm. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Mm -hmm. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, mm -hmm. a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which Yahweh pitched and not man. Now, see, this is the tabernacle, the true tabernacle that Yahweh pitched and not the man. And that includes what the first speaker uh, went through, uh, the migratory pattern, which is the greater and more perfect sanctuary, otherwise known as the universe. Also, you have a physical creation here for Egypt. You have an angelic creation here in the wilderness of Sinai, both coming out of spirit law, see, or operating by spirit law, or controlled by spirit law. Okay? It's the greater, this is, the, this is what Yahweh pitched and not the man. Okay, and I'll jump down to the fifth verse. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, mm -hmm. as Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. For see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Okay, you'd make this according. This is, now, this is the divine pattern. This, I'm talking about this shape and form. This is Elohim. This is the archetype pattern of the universe. What Moses created down here is the divine pattern of the, of the universe. See, in other words, this, we have this tabernacle here. This tabernacle comes out of this archetype pattern or out of the temple. Because, and the reason why I know that because back here, the tabernacle stood on Mount Zion for 45 years before it was put back into this temple. I said, well, now somebody said, well, wait a minute. The tabernacle was created first in the wilderness before the temple was. But see, you have to understand the spiritual ramification. The tabernacle came first came out of the temple. Get it? This is the temple. See, of Yahweh here. That Yahweh pitched and not the man. And this tabernacle, which is the word or son. And this tabernacle is the explanation of this word. So if it comes out of this temple, then you have to see where this tabernacle has to go back into the temple. And that prefigures what we have to do in the, es in the es eschatological scheme of things. See, just as <coughs> here, here's the man Adam on the sixth day. All right, he's created. Then he's told to lay down and the uh, rib and the womb is taken out and a womb man is brought to him and here they are up here the unity of the, the of the sexes up here and where he says this is bone of my bone flesh is my flesh so therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother etc all right understanding these things helps you to understand the purpose at all because one is going to go by this tabernacle pattern through the steps that, that was espoused by the first speaker also you have a principle of Ascending and descending. Maybe we should throw that in there. Genesis 28 and 10. And then I just got to go through a couple of preliminaries and then we will. Genesis 28 and 10. Get into our and Jacob go ahead. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Mm -hmm. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. All right, now pause. Now, he, he's going to sleep here. 
Sleep is a type of death, and death is a type of sleep. Okay, continue. And he dreamed. Pause. Now he's now immersed in a dream. Okay, go ahead. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens, and behold, the angels of Elohim ascending and descending on it. All right, pause. Now, the first speaker went through the steps of the tabernacle pattern and the migratory pattern, which, and each step is like a rung on a ladder. And there are angels ascending and descending on this ladder, all right? That's what some of these plates do. Some of these plates may be a descending plate. Another plate may be an ascending <laughs> plate. There are a couple of plates that will do both. This is a descending and ascending plate. The story starts up here with Abraham, and his seed had to go down into a a land they knew not of and be evilly entreated, but they would come out with great substance and would claim their inheritance. It's a round trip, see? So that's what we're looking for. First John 5 and 7, and we'll, and we'll throw this in here, and also Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, and then we'll proceed into something. First John 5 and 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, mm -hmm. the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Mm -hmm. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now, now this is an ascending and descending plate, too. You see how I did with the stick? Was when she was reading, I was up here, then I descended down, and then I came back up. This is, an a, this is a descending and ascending plate itself. This this plate right here, showing the witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Read a little bit more. Okay, that's eight. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of Yahweh is greater. Mm -hmm. For this is the witness of Yahweh, which he has testified of his son. He that believeth on the son of Yahweh has the witness in himself. Mm -hmm. He that believeth not Yahweh has made him a liar because he believeth not the record that Yahweh gave to his son. Okay. Now, see, and every human being has that witness. Everybody walking around has blood running warm in his veins. They have water and a spirit that's animating them. Or you can even say breathe air. So your existence is proof of his existence. Okay. Now, can we read Isaiah 28, 9, and 10? Isaiah 28 and 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, mm -hmm. and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Mm -hmm. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Now, now what we went through here is the spirit, the water, and the blood. These are precepts or principle. Precept must be upon precept. Read. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line, see, this is a line here because the way this, these charts are structured, threefold, like the tabernacle, see, the cup of holy anointing oil here at the door, that, that's a type of spirit. That's a line. See, one line going across. All right? Here's the water, brazen labor. That's a principle or precept. That's a line that goes all the way across. Okay? Blood, that's a precept or a principle. It's a line that goes all the way across. Okay? Continue. Uh, 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 but we, uh, let me say this. We even have a heaven line. I'll throw that in there because that's in the textbook. The most holy place of all of these plates represents heaven. So you have a heaven line going all the way across. Okay? Now you can see. Read. Line upon line. Now it's line, spirit line upon the water line, read. Here a little and there a little. Here a little in the law. The law is the first five books of the Bible, what Moses wrote. And see, everything hinges on what Moses wrote because Moses was shown a vision. See, 
and it was and it was written down and everything that Moses wrote or was shown to him is drawn out of the prophets. They could not say anything unless they could go back and point to something that Moses wrote in the law, the first five books of the Bible, Exodus, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, see, to show the, that, oh, what you're saying is true. Uh, because they would just ask, anytime a prophet would come forth and say, uh, so, da, 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 they would just ask, okay, show me where Moses talks about it at. Just show me, you know, show me where you're getting that. What, what are you basing this on? Okay. Continue. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Because that's what happened back here with Moses at the burning bush. He, he protested, saying that he, was, he couldn't speak well. He was a stammerer, see? And Yahweh said, well, Aaron, your brother, speaks well. He's coming to meet you, and both of you will go down together. He'll, he, you will be a law unto him, and he will be a prophet unto you, okay? So you have the law and the prophet, Moses and Aaron, the law and the prophet coming down together to Egypt to render judgment upon Egypt. Okay, but continue. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to wet. Now rest. this is the rest, see, because you have the, the witnesses of the spirit, the water, and the blood, which is the same as the death, the burial, the resurrection. All right? That's the refresher. See, go ahead. And this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. Mm -hmm. But the word of Yahweh was unto them, precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. See, just go ahead. Precept upon precept. Mm -hmm. Line upon line, line, line up upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Take a little bit from the law, a little bit from the prophecy. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Because, see, because Yahshua's going to come along. He's going to fulfill, jot and tittle, everything that's in the law and the prophets, these 613 ordinances, 4,000 years of people, places, and things. He's going to perform this and bring it to an end in 33 and a half years. A monumental work, but he's up to the task. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? Now, that's, we can elaborate as much as we like, you know, and, 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 and it's very easy to do. But the thing we want to try to do is, is to draw the principles out or the precepts of what we're doing. And Dr. Kinley said many times that you cannot explain this whole thing in two hours. So what you have to do is take certain things that you can explain within a reasonable amount of time to show the overall principle. Okay? In his textbook, he takes various plates and he puts them together so that he can make a correlations or comparative analysis to bring forth a doctrinal point, all right? Now, we have tenets. Our three main tenets of, this, of our doctrine is basically this. One, the unity of the spirit, which includes the names and titles, Yahweh, Elohim, Yahshua, because when you study, truly study the names and titles, you are studying the different states of spirit, okay? See, because you have Yahweh who is pure spirit, see? abstract state. No one has ever seen him. So it behooves him to take on shape and form known as the word which he, which he himself termed as Elohim, a divine title, the word or son. Then this word or son was made flesh. See, who is Yahshua, see? Or you got two manifestations of the one spirit. But to understand that, see, you have to understand the names as well because Yahweh means he who brings into existence whatever exists. See? Elohim means, simply means the almighty. And it's a pluralistic term. That's a plural term. And somebody said, well, does it mean the gods? Because some, some people you know, have a problem with that title, particularly those of the sacred name movement. They don't like that because it means the gods. Well, it can't be the gods. You know, no, it just, means, it just means two. It's plural because Elohim, in a spiritual sense, is male and female in one embodiment in principle. See, and here you got Yahshua, the word made flesh, or Yahweh is salvation. See, and we say, well, he took on the masculine portion of the name. Well, yeah, you can say that. But you can also say this, that Yah is an abbreviation for Yahweh. See, meaning that you may see the Yah, but the way is there because she, the way is hidden in the Yah just as Eve was hidden in Adam. See, these are principles that you will begin to learn the more that you engage these charts, which is the representation of a divine panoramic vision and revelation, which is colossal, stupendous, awesome, etc. Okay? 
Now, in saying all that, let us pick our subject for the, for the day. Okay, we have our. Hey, we gotta do something like this. I I'm not feeling this this cow's head, man. I know for some of you, it reminds me of the golden, golden calf. calf. You know, I'm <laughs> telling you, like, yeah, we're reaching in the golden calf here. <laughs> I'm like, no, man. I gotta find my job. I don't know what I did, but I put it in storage because I had to move a lot of stuff. And uh, and this came about for a little girl, <laughs> if you could believe that, for a, for a little eleven year old girl, you know, when I was in Texas, and it has forty two numbers in it. Maybe I should say that it has forty two numbers in it. The first forty deals with the forty plates, of course. If the number forty one comes up, then we have to explain this plate. This plate is called spiritual temple plate. I have seen in other classes they say baptism and ministry. That is incorrect. Baptism and ministry plate is number 29. You can go to the fourth volume of the textbook and it will tell you quite plainly this is called spiritual temple plate. So anyway, if you pick number 41, we have to explain this. If you pick number 42, then you have to explain these eight circles up here. All right? Now, mind you, this elementary chart was the first chart that Dr. Kenley drew. And really, if he didn't draw any other charts, this chart is complete within itself to explain the purpose and plan of Yahweh in its entirety. Because it says so, a pattern of plans up. And, and it's from start, from start to finish. It can do that. But out of love, it behooved the man to make other charts you know, you know, draw it out to you know show this particular aspect, that particular aspect. He drew seven charts all together, right? Now other people have drawn charts. You know, we even drew a chart. We got one over there, the EMP. You know, and it's a it's a it's an okay chart, but it's but I wouldn't dare say that that chart or any other chart that anybody made comes to the same level of these charts. They're good, they're adjuncts, you can point to it, you know, like the green chart over there, if I need to show something about the womb, I got an illustration over there I can point to. There's nothing wrong with that. No, you know, nothing wrong with that at all. All I'm simply saying is that these seven charts that Dr. Kindley drew are the ones that, that he saw and experienced in a vision, okay? And so, so these are the charts that I try to concentrate on so that we can hopefully get a better understanding of what we're looking at. And like I said, I made this for an 11-year-old girl. Let's see. Josiah, you're the youngest one in the room. Why don't you stick your hand in there, bro? Pick out something. What you got? 39. 30, man, I swear. 39. Why don't, you, why don't you bring 38, 39, and 40 up? See, because, and the reason why I say that, when you begin to get into these plates, you will find out that they all correlate with each other, without a doubt. But there are certain plates that, are have, that have infinity. Uh, 38, 39, 40, like right there. I think that, that would work. <coughs> all right. And see, he picked 39, but I had the other two picked up as long with it because to really get into 39, you have to get into 38. And to really understand what's happening here, then 40 comes right after this. So really, these three plates, they are what I call an affinity. Let's look up that word, affinity. Can we look that word up? Affinity, a similarity of characteristics suggesting a relationship, especially a resemblance in structure between animals, plants, or languages. Um, a relationship, especially by marriage and opposed to blood ties. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Merriam Webster says, relationship by marriage. Um, Go back to the earlier one. I think you mentioned something that was one of the earlier. The other one, uh, a similarity of characteristics suggesting a relationship. Okay. All right, good. Similarity of characteristics. That's why these three plates are up here. He picked one, <laughs> but, but these are an affinity because they are 
It's all related to each other. And you'll find that out when you, when you start going through these plates, that there are plates that are very, I mean, they all correlate with each other, but there are certain plates that have an affinity or certain characteristics that are very similar. Okay. Uh, uh, do we have, no, we, we need a microphone for you, Chris. This one has a likeness based on relationship or casual connection. Okay. Thank you. That, that's even better. Appreciate that. That's what you'll find out with uh, when you start going through these plates. Okay. All right. So, and ironically, Eschatology is the subject that's at the uh, the Chicago yeah Chicago seminar in a, that's coming up in a couple of weeks or so, and uh, yeah, the spirit of Yahweh's working here. That's all I can say. All right, now as we said, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. Also, here a little, there a little, and the law and the prophets. Also, it's ascending and descending. All right, so we're going to start with eschatology first. Now, eschatology means the end of all things, or that, that pertains to the last things, of, you know, to the end. All right, eschatology. Now, this is a descending plate, and the reason why I can say that, let's go to, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, I'm thinking. First Thessalonians 4 and 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, mm -hmm. concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For it, if we believe that Yahshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yahshua yeah. will he bring with him. Mm -hmm. For this we say unto you by the word of Yahweh, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Savior shall not prevent them which are asleep. Mm -hmm. For Yahshua himself shall descend from heaven with a the shout. There it is. For Yahshua here shall descend from heaven with a shout. All right. Now the question is, keep your finger there. The question is we want to ask, what heaven are we talking about? Okay. Um, Cosmogony, plate four. And 2 Corinthians 12 and, and 1. 2 Corinthians 12 and 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Thank you. I will come to visions and revelations of Yahweh. I knew a man in the Messiah more than 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, Yahweh knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in a body or out of a body I cannot tell, Yahweh knoweth. How that he was caught up into glory and heard unspeakable words, which it is not possible for a man to utter. Okay, okay good enough. Now, <coughs> I had cosmogony play put up because it's the illustration of the third heaven. And then here's the second heaven here. See, we got a veil here. This is division between spirit and matter. All right, spirit and matter. All right, keep that in mind. And then th here we got the second heaven, which is the atmospheric heaven, all right, which we, rain comes from, birds fly through. And then we have a veil here dividing the first and second heaven. All right, here's the first heaven here, which is space. The earth has like a ball in space. Here we got the earth here with the molten lava at, the, at its core, inorganic earth, like the altar. And then we got the steam rising, the you know, water vapor, steam, see? That's like into the brazen laver. All right, and it's in a cloudy form. And when, well, we got the spirit of Elohim here moving across the face of the deep. So that's the spirit principle. All right, so now we got third heaven, second heaven, first heaven. I said, now let's just draw a line. Now, Yahshua says he's going to descend from heaven with a shout. The heaven he's talking about is eternity. It's not the atmospheric heaven beyond the sun, moon, and stars. 
it's not the first heaven, see, which is the earth. But heaven here is here. Because this is where he came to see, the day of Pentecost. He said he came to here. See, this is, this is the third heaven where he is, exp you know, where he is at. All right? Third heaven. Now he's going to come, go back to Thessalonians, what you read. First Thessalonians 4 and 16. For Yahshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, uh -huh. with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of Yahweh. And the dead in the Messiah shall rise first. Mm -hmm. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yahshua in the air. Mm -hmm. And so shall we ever be with him. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, now, p now we, she just read something that a lot of people get stuck on because Christians read it and say, see, it's a rapture. See, we're going to be caught up in the air. See, we're gonna, the dead people are going to rise up physically, as they think. Going to open the graves. They're going to rise up. And we're just going to rise up. I mean, can you picture that? Billions and billions of bodies floating planet wide, you know, <laughs> trying to rise up to some little figure up in the sky. Half of it is in the daytime. The other half is in the night. <laughs> right? I mean, that's just calamity right there. But that's not what it's talking about. See, because Yahshua resurre resurrected a spiritual being. See, and he, and, it's, and he poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost into all flesh. See? All right. So now, so now, this is this is a, a this is a vision, really, just like here when he went up his death, burial, resurrection. See, and he went up in a vision. So if he went up in a vision, then he, then therefore he would have to appear in a vision. See, play fourteen. See, what we're doing here, <clears throat> we're, we're using other plates with the same principles to compare what's going on, okay? Here, angelic transgression. Veils. Let me say something about the veils. One of the most probably le you know, understated principles in the pattern that a lot of people may not grasp as well. The veils do represent a separation but they also represent points of transition. That when you cross a veil, there has to be a transition. See, here, there was war in heaven. Lucifer and his angels fought against, you know, Michael and his angels, and Michael defeated them by the blood of the Lamb. So they were cast out. Once they were cast out, they passed through this veil, angelic invisibility. That simply means this. Coming through the veil, now they're in the holy place. They now hear. So my Lucifer now has the ability to appear in a vision. Angelic visibility. Okay? Here, here it is right here. Lucifer appearing to Eve. Angelic visibility. He's appearing to her in a vision. He's not incarnating in her, but he's appearing to her in a vision. See, because he's passed through a veil. All right? Now, here, they're cast out. Here's another veil. Division between invisibility and visibility. Now, they're cast here, immersed into ethereal darkness. Because they have the mark 666 on them, what they are marked for is incarnation in the flesh. At this time, there's no fleshly bodies here. But they're, but they're looking, going to and fro. Looking, Okay? Now, the righteous angels, let's take this since I'm on that vein. Let's say Michael and Gabriel, all right? When they come down, they can pass through this veil. And they, too, can appear in a state of angelic visibility, meaning they can appear in a vision to someone as well. However, for them, when they go through this veil, the division between invisibility and visibility, when they pass through it, they are capable of taking on the likeness of sinful flesh. See, in other words, they could just come into a body. That's th because they didn't sin. These angels were demoted when they were cast out. The satanic angels, they were demoted when they were cast out. That demotion includes not being able to take on a body. They can incarnate in a body, but they cannot take on a body. In other words, they cannot come into the likeness of sinful flesh. They have to incarnate in sinful flesh. I'm talking about these demons. But the righteous angels don't have to do that. They can just take on a body. 
They can look like a baby or a billionaire or a bum or, you know, or a businessman, you know, male or female, don't matter, you know. You know, and you wouldn't know the difference. It's like the ones that visited Abraham. See, they sat down, shook hands with him, sat down, ate a meal. <laughs> you know, he couldn't tell him. How would you know? You don't have the spirit of discernment, but you wouldn't know. See, but that's just showing you, using the pattern, what's going on with these things. And then we're, we're coming over here, because see, the reason why I'm doing this, because this is what's happening here when Yahshua appears, or Elam is revealed from heaven. It's in a vision. It's in a state of angelic visibility. And they have to come through the sixth step, which is a veil. See, if I draw a line, I'm, that'd be like the Jordan River. It was opening. It was an opening here. Or if I draw a line this way, come to the tabernacle pattern. See, I point to this because you know, the veil in the temple rent in twain. So now I got to look for a principle of a veil. And that principle is Acts 17, 24. Acts 17 and 24. Mm -hmm. Yahweh who made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is ruler of heaven and earth, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one man all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek him, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He be not far, why? Because he's in us. <laughs> he's not far from us. See, so here's the veil. See, the whole human race, physically speaking, is one flesh or one veil, because we all came from Adam. I, I like to say it like this. We are all first, the whole human race, we're all first cousins to each other. Just eight billion times removed. See? Dr. Kinley once said in a lecture, he said, look, he said, well, the whole human race is one in the flesh. We're all one in the flesh. The problem is we need to become one in the spirit. But we're already one in the flesh. The whole human race. There's really no big difference. I mean, there's no real big differences between us. I mean, cosmetically, as far as maybe a skin color or maybe the shape of your nose or eyes or lips, you know, that's cosmetic. But we are all the same species because we can mate with each other, you know, and out of that comes different combinations, you know. You know and you can't say, well, this is better than that one. It, it just don't work like that. See? see? Uh, well, well, okay. Uh, let's see, Get Thessalonians, I think it's, uh, I was the one, I think it's, it's a one and one and four, it's where it talks about flaming vengeance, it could be second Thessalonians, second Thessalonians, second Thessalonians one and eight, second, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, second Thessalonians, first chapter, uh, uh, go, go a little bit, uh, Start with six. Okay. Second Thessalonians one and six. Oh, so start with five. Start with five. Second Thessalonians one and five. Uh huh. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of Yahweh, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of Yahweh, mm -hmm. for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with Yahweh to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, mm -hmm. and to you who are troubled rest with us. When Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, mm -hmm. taking vengeance on them that know not Yahweh mm -hmm. and that obey not the gospel of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, right. who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of Yahweh and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his sons and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Okay, good enough. Now, he's coming in flaming vengeance. And look, if, if we are appearing with him, then we're coming in flaming vengeance right along with him. And you know what? That flaming vengeance, they see these people here with, color, with these clothes on, colored clothes here? See, these are the people that are not here appearing in that body. And look, 
they, they're clothed with their concepts, their opinions, their theories, their doctrines, their hypotheses, and they, they now they see that what they have falls way short of the glory they could have had. See, a lot of these people, the gospel was preached to, and they rejected it. Some of them people could be your relatives or your friends or the people you work with, you know. Flaming because see, when this day comes, it's going to be brought back to their remembrance that they had an opportunity and they turned it down. But it's too late <laughs> at this point to say, oh, I, I just need another chance. Well, well, you had your opportunity. Now it's gone because we're, cause the purpose is moving on. It's not going to stop. And say, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, we, let's just pause for a minute and we'll bring these folks. No, the purpose is going to keep going. It's not going to stop for anybody. It's just going to keep going. That's why it's incumbent upon you now as we speak while you're walking around, you know, in these bodies, warm, you know, in these warm bodies for you to understand and believe what is getting ready to happen here. Because at this point, it will be way, way too late. Okay? So now, <clears throat> let's just look at this. Here's Joshua. He's on the throne. It's on the throne in your consciousness. He's on the throne in everybody's consciousness, but everybody just don't know it, okay? And so now he's going to be revealed from heaven. He's going to be revealed from those who know. And the veils is rent. That is to say, the human race. And seeing all of this is going to be seen in a vision. And it said in the scripture we read with, uh, it said they will be caught up in the air. Well, see, look, a man is made body, soul, spirit okay so when I went in so let's just draw a line and it says we're going to be caught up in the air see it's talking about see now the air according to the, the heavens that's the second heaven the atmospheric heaven but we're not going to be caught up there see body soul spirit it, it means that you're going to be caught up let's draw a line in the soul in your consciousness that's what it's talking about see and not being caught up in the app because Joshua is not appearing from beyond the sun, moon, and stars. He's appearing from where he, from, first of all, he's not coming back from anywhere for the simple reason he didn't go anywhere. See, he, because Joshua is come in the flesh since the day of Pentecost. Seven years later, it was passed on to the Gentiles. And he is come in the flesh since then. So now what it is, it's a universal revelation of Joshua from those who know. See, in here, all right? Now, here, this is, we're looking for the principles in the holy place, which is the light, the bread, the intercessor. See, the trumpets blowing. See, the light, that, it's all Joshua. He's the light, he's the intercessor, and he's the bread. See, and it's going to happen within that hour. See, it's not going to be a whole long time coming, but within that hour when he, when he, uh, when he uh, is revealed from heaven, See, that all this will, will take place. These folks here will be cast into the lake of fire. We did an analogy the other day. S second day of creation, plate seven. See, we did an analogy, and, uh, if, and if you would read, uh, yeah, read the second day of creation. I think we got time for that. Genesis 1 and 6. Mm -hmm. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which was above the firmament, and it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning was the second day. Okay. Now we have that illustrated here. The firmament is the atmosphere. That's the vault, see, that separates the waters above from the waters beneath. And listen, scientists have verified that there are literally oceans of water in the atmosphere. I mean, you know, the clouds, I mean, there's literally oceans of water. And then there are oceans of water. I mean, we know that there are waters above the surface, the, the so-called seven seas. But there's also underground reservoirs of water, the waters beneath. All right. Now read 
Genesis 7 and 11. 7 and 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, mm -hmm. in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Mm -hmm. The fountains of the great deep here were broken up, read. And the floodgates of heaven was open. And the floodgates of heaven were open, see, or the windows of heaven were open. I like that scripture better. Oh, but yeah. But this right. is, that's okay. The floodgates, see, which is showing you a renting of the veil. Because it's at the sixth step, just like the Jordan River opened, just like the veil in the temple was rent in twain. The floodgates were open, or there was a renting here. Likewise here, because the door, see, come draw a line. The, the Red Sea opened up, didn't it? On the migratory pattern, that's reflected to the door. That's an opening there, the door. The Red Sea opened up. So now here's the fountains of the deep opening up, and the water's coming through. The windows of heaven or the floodgates opening up and the water's coming down. And mankind just caught in the middle. It's caught in the middle of it. Come over here because it says it's the same thing. It says instead of water, it'll be fire. Yahshua Messiah coming in flaming vengeance. That's the fire opening up here. And then fire from below because we said here, draw a line. See, isn't there fire down here in the earth? See, there's fire from below. See, and the door opening up and mankind caught in the middle why because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh and flesh and right. blood will certainly burn under fire if you are made a minister of fire fire can't hurt fire but fire most certainly can hurt flesh and blood and that's what's happening here they're concepts of flesh and blood fleshly concepts that's going to get hurt by the divine mm -hmm. fire from, from below divine fire from above Okay, see, and so now they're immersed, talking about these folks here, they are now, by the Spirit, immersed into the lake of fire. Why? Because this is where, this is what happened to these folks. See, they're immersed in ethereal darkness. Here, awaiting punishment. That punishment will happen here. See, that fire, see, that will immerse them as well, and they'll be destroyed. As I said, this is a descending plate. So we started here, and we're coming down, and we're going here. Because, see, the lake of fire is Yahweh. The lake of fire is you, if you are in Yahweh. See, by which all, because it's, it's how all things came about here. See, it came in by fire, so it has to go out that way. Right. And see, here's this heart, who is Elohim, coming between the veil, transmuting in part into one hydrogen atom. And here's this one atom being told, be fruitful and multiply. That atom is in the image and likeness of Elohim, who is the archetype pattern of the universe. All right? And so now here, it's Yahshua who's appearing here, and all things are appearing in him. We are in him. See? We are in him. See, the cosmogony and the eschatology are really one and the same. One is declaring the end from the beginning, to be honest with you. But now, here we go. We're coming down, all right, immersed. They're immersed. In, you know, everything is going to be immersed in the lake of fire, not just these folks here. All things will be immersed in the lake of fire. It's like because here we have a renovation of the earth. See, not the renovation of this earth, but the renovation of this earth. See, because you have to receive an immortal glorified body. Uh, where's that at? Uh, it talks about the, the parable of the... Um, The wineskins, that's what I want. Uh, Luke five thirty seven. Let's see what that says. Luke 5 and 37. And no man putteth, yes, that's it. Luke 5 and 37. And no man putteth new wine into old skins. Mm -hmm. Else the new wine. Well, let's just start with 36 because there's, okay. there's a double. 
analogy there. Start with 36. Luke 5 and 36. Mm -hmm. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. I see, now, that's apropos. Nobody puts a, a piece of new garment on, on an old. In other words, this is the new garment here. When Yahshua was appearing and we appearing, you can't put this new garment on this old. Talking about these concepts. So you can't do that. You know, I mean, they, you know these people at this point, you, you can't repair that. See, but read. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a tear, mm -hmm. and the piece that was taken out of the new doth not match with the old. See, the piece taken out of the new, it don't match with the old. These are the concepts of man. And so the, and so the principles of Yahshua do not match the concepts of man. Theories and hypotheses, opinions, and so forth. And so it don't match. Read. And no man putteth new wine into old skin. Now you can't put new wine into an old skin. What we have right now is new wine. Talking about the Holy Spirit since the day of Pentecost. And the sister Gentiles were brought in at seven years later. We have new wine, or as Dr. Kinley said, an immortal spirit dwelling in a mortal body. So we have new wine in an old skin, so to speak, right now. We'll read. Else the new wine will burst the skins mm -hmm. and be spilled, and the skin shall be ruined. Now, see, we can't, we, these bodies cannot contain that new wine. It, it just cannot. I mean, we're doing okay for the moment, but we really can't contain it. At least not now, because we look, just look at it. We're in the fourth age here. We got five ages to go. That's a journey. Th these physical bodies can't take it. It's just not. It's just not equipped for that type of journey. It's not equipped for it. Okay, but read. But new wine must be put into new skins. New wine must be put into new skins. A new skin. Renovation of the earth. This will be renovated. This container will be renovated so that it can properly hold the new wine that is in us now. It will be properly renovated. The renovation of the earth. This earth. Read. And both are preserved. And both. Here it is. The new earth state. Both are preserved. The new wine as well as the new body. Both are preserved. Read. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new. Mm -hmm. For he saith the old wine, the old is better. See, the old is better. This is, this is the, this is the ancients of day. Ancient means old. This is the ancient of days. See, this is the same wine that started everything off. And the wine we're going to be drinking is the same wine that started off, that started everything off with. But here we are here in the new earth state. Let's get, uh, where am I at? <sighs> Revelation 22. 22 and 1. <laughs> yeah, 22 and 1. Revelations 22 and 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, mm -hmm. proceeding out of the throne of Yahweh and of the Lamb, mm -hmm. in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits. Okay, that says on either side of the river. Let's draw a line. See, go to the migratory pattern. It says, if you remember in the stories, when Israel came up out of Egypt and that new birth happened out here, 144,000 that followed Joshua along in here, they were given their plots of land or their inheritance. Their inheritances were on both sides of the river. Okay? They're on both sides of the river, as it is now. See, your inheritance, see, see, we're here, see, it's on both sides of the river while we're in the flesh. Okay? And so sh it's just showing you the comparison. It says on the river. What river is it talking about? Well, the Jordan River in principle. It says on both sides of the river. Just why? Because that's what happened. They had inheritance on both sides. So now here they got inheritance on both sides. Here in the incorporeal, here in the eternity. Because this, this is where they're getting, this is where they're going to. Let's put it like this. 
Eschatology here happens at the end of the fourth age. Well, actually, the fourth age ended in 1960. So this is really at the end of the probation period here. Now we're going into the revel, revel, uh, renovation of the earth. Now we're in the new earth state. The new earth state is the fifth age. Draw a line. Why? Because in the fifth step of the migratory pattern, they all had to assemble together in front of Mount Sinai. So it's the same way here. There has to be an assembly. And seeing just as the tabernacle was placed in the midst of them, here's Yahshua, who is the true tabernacle, being placed in the midst of them. Here. We can see the type in the shadow to see the same thing here. Okay? Continue. And yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Mm -hmm. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Yahweh and of the Lamb shall mm -hmm. be in it. And his servants shall serve him. Mm -hmm. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Mm -hmm. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For Yahweh Elohim giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Okay, see, it's the same thing here. There was, no there was no night here in the wilderness, remember? It was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Right? And that high priest, he, when he went up there and did his performance, he had, to, he had to put the mitre on. That mitre had somebody's name on it. What name was that? See? Holiness to Yahweh. Holiness to Yahweh. See? All of that is what he's showing here. You can see in types, in the migratory pattern and in the tabernacle pattern. Okay? See, see all of that here. Now, and that's the, and Yahshua, see, he's the light, he's the bread, and he's the intercessor. Okay, is there anything more you keep reading? 22 and 6, and he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh the Elohim of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come suddenly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Mm -hmm. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Mm -hmm. Then saith he unto me, See thou doeth not. Don't you do that. Don't, don't worship me, Read. For I am thy fellow servant. I'm a fellow servant just like you are. See. And of thy brethren and the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book, mm -hmm. worship Yahweh. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. The time, the time, the time is at hand. It is at hand. You can tell by the chaotic nature of the world today. The time is at hand. Let's get 1 Corinthians 15, <sighs> maybe around, I'm thinking 22. What does that say? For as in Adam all die. That, that's good enough. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Mm -hmm. For as in Adam all die, uh -huh. even so in the Messiah shall all be made alive. Read. But every man in his own order, <laughs> the Messiah, the first fruits, mm -hmm. afterward, they that are the Messiahs at his coming. See, they that are the Messiahs at his coming, see. That is it, when he's universally revealed. Right. Some of us may not be walking around when that happened. You know, Dr. Ken even talked about it. Maybe sleeping out in the cemetery or something when that happened. Some of us may well be walking around when this happened, you know, and we'll just be just taken out. It's like that. See? All right, but read. But read. Then cometh the end. Mm -hmm. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Yahweh, even the Father, mm -hmm. when he shall have put down all rule and all authority now, and power. Now he's going here. He's putting down all rule and authority and power because see, into the lake of fire is going to be what you see on the Daniel chart. All these different kingdoms, the beast, the the, the anti the anti Messiah, all, you know, all, human government, all of that, the sun, moon, and stars, all of that is just going up in here, and it's going to be a great renovation of the earth. See, renovation of this earth, all right? And we're resurrecting. See, there's a death, burial, immersed in it, and a resurrection of it coming up out of that. And we receive these new immortal glorified bodies, all right? Or new wineskins, but keep reading. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. See, all enemies under his feet. See, look here. See, see his feet 
destroy our line. Our enemies will be put under his feet because that's where he is. He's standing on the earth. The earth is like a blue sapphire stone. He's standing on the earth. He said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Okay, but continue. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Mm -hmm. For he hath put all things under his feet. Mm -hmm. But when he saith, all things are put under him, mm -hmm. it is manifest that he is excluded. Now, it's manifest that he is excluded. Because, see, at this point, see, all, th all things came out from him. That's why we have this half man here. See, and Elohim is, is, is pierced in the side. There's an illustration of that in the textbook. You know, him being, you know, just like the creation is drawn out of him, just like Eve was drawn out of Adam. So now, likewise, it all has to go back into him. If it was drawn out of him, then here, everything's going back into him. And it says he is excluded, or he's put all things under his feet. We have to be integrated back into him. What do I mean by that? Let's just draw a line. Here, you have the high priest here on the Day of Atonement. All right, on the Day of Atonement, he had three types of blood he had to, he had to bring up in here. He had to bring in the bullock, and then he had to bring in the, the goat, blood of a goat, and he had to bring in the blood of a ram. Now, when he went up here three times, the first two times he went in, he just had on linen garments here, as we see here. The third time he went up, he went up in the garments of beauty and glory. He had to put on the mitre, the ephod, the breastplate, all right? And when he did that, particularly the breastplate, because the breastplate had 12 stones on it, that would represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So when he went up the third time, he, put, he would put these garments on. In other words, he's taking Israel with him. He's putting Israel on, and he's taking Israel up, who is the bride, up to present Israel before the Father, okay? Likewise, see now that's happening here. Here, this is after the order of Melchizedek, and he's just going up once. So now he's going to put on the garments of beauty and glory. What garments of beauty and glory? Us, because remember, we were those wineskins. See, we, were that, we was the wine and w in which the wineskins were made perfect. So now here we are in glorified Immortal glorified bodies, all right? Garments of beauty and glory, which he's going to put on, talking about Elohim, and take us up into the Father, all right? And present us before the Father, just like the high priest did. Now here, I want Ezekiel 46 and 1. Because, see, here, we have to show that there's a principle of an opening, all right? Is because this is the sixth step. See, if the new earth state... It's the fifth step or the fifth age. Then the sixth step here, which is a type of an opening, is also representative of the sixth age. All right? The sixth age. Ezekiel 46 and 1. Thus saith Yah Yahweh, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days. Then now why east? Because it's faith, the tabernacle, whenever it was set up, as well as the temple, had to face east or face toward the rising sun so that when the sun would rise, see if you remember, it was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, all right, that lit up the, the whole uh, wilderness. Here in the tabernacle, during the time of the cloud, see, this lampstand was out, was not lit. Now, the, when, the when, the, um, when the cloud would turn into a pillar of fire, it did that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 3 o'clock in the afternoon is when they would light this lampstand. All right? And it would burn from 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 9 p.m. the next day when they put it out. Because by that point, the, the tabernacle facing east, the natural sunrise light would shine through the door into the tabernacle. Okay? So now, go ahead and read. So now... Yeah, go ahead and read it. But on the Sabbath, it shall be open. Now, on the Sabbath, it shall be open. After six days, see, see, after six days on the Sabbath, it shall be open, where he can go in here now, all right, and appear before the Father. That's why we have here this, the sabbatical age, which is all in all. The new earth state is the fifth step or the sixth or the fifth age. The sixth step is Elohim, you know, being uh, all things put under his feet. 
All right? And the seventh age is when he's going up in here. That's the seventh step or the seventh age or the seventh step, which is a sabbatical age, which is all in all because keep reading. Uh, no, no, where you at? Uh, in, um, Ezekiel. No, no, I'm sorry. Can you uh, read a little bit more in Ezekiel? And in the day of the new moon, it shall be open. In the day of the new moon, it shall be open. What is the new moon? No moon. No law. It's spirit law. See, that's what we're talking about. Now, I came over here because there are seven ages up here. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. The sixth age is what we're talking about here. See, where, El where all things are put under Elohim, under his feet. And then in the seventh age, see, at the end of the sixth age, then he's going to go into the seventh or go into his breast, the sabbatical. I think the scripture says it like this. The Sabbath, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for the man. Okay, so now he's going up here, and listen, when he goes up here, it's got to be the same thing in principle that when he did here. When he went up here, he had to go beyond the veil, and then come in, and then get in front of the Ark of the Covenant between the two stays, and then he had to move it around to the other side, and then it, while he's facing east, that's when he would flick the blood and then move it back around and then he could never turn his back on it and then back out on the other side back to the altar of incense. So in other words, that's like, that's an eight. See, there's a figure eight there, all right? In principle, that has to happen here, all right? Go back to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto no, you. No, no, where we will have left off because we were reading 27 or somewhere. <laughs> yeah, all things under his feet, yeah. Where was, where was it? Where was it? 27? Anybody? 1 Corinthians 15, 27. For he hath put all things under his feet. Mm -hmm. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he ex is excluded. He is excluded because all things are now put under him. That's the sixth age, right? All things are now put under him, and, and he's, this, he's just standing there, just him, as he was in the beginning. But now go ahead. Which did put all things under him. Mm -hmm. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. Mm-hmm that Yahweh may be all in all. Now he's going beyond he's going beyond the veil in principle. Now he's standing before the throne. And us in him, with him, presenting us to the because here is the sap the sabbatical age and Yahweh is all in all. So in principle he has to do that figure eight. And when he does the figure eight, then when he comes out, this is what he looks like here. See? He's coming out. He, um, he himself is the sanctum of sanctorums. And see, and at this point, seven ages, see, the lampstand is lit, and he's in the midst of the lampstand. Seven ages have been completed. He has seven stars in his hand, see, signifying seven new ages, because see, the star, he himself is the star. He's the star. But there's seven of them, see, and see, meaning that he's appearing in each of the seven ages. See, this is the eighth age, or the beginning of a new set of ages, the beginning of a new week of ages at the beginning. Um, where is it at? It's in the textbook. It's in volume one. Um, it's in the section of uh, volume one, page ninety three. Um, why don't you read the, just start, yeah, start at the top and just okay. read it. Okay. 
the importance of rightly dividing the seven dispensations and ages. Time begins and ends within the realm of eternity. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we must bear in mind, remember, and know the difference between one age and the other, the difference between one dispensation and the other. Mm -hmm. The following definitions of an age and dispensation were taken from a Webster's Dictionary. Age a particular period of time of history mm -hmm. as distinguished from another, a historical or geological period, um, e epoch. An epoch, uh -huh. go ahead. For example, each age is approximately 2,000 years long. Mm -hmm. The antediluvian age is a short age of uh. 1656. Now see, now they say 2,000 years for most scholars will say, they say that's the average amount of years that would constitute an age. Now, since the antediluvian age here lasted only 1,656 years, short of 2,000, then it's considered to be a short age. Continue. The post-diluvian age is a long age of mm -hmm. 2,377 years. Mm -hmm. Will the present age must be a short age? See chart. Okay, now... The post-Diluvian age is a long age because it's 2,377 years. So it's, it's considered to be a long age because it's a little over 2,000. So now the question is, you know, the present age, will this be a long age or will this be a short age? I think Dr. Kennedy's feeling was that this will probably be a short age. <laughs> that, that, was his, that was his viewpoint on it, okay? But continue reading. Did you want me to read the chart? Yes, I do. The ages are in the following order. Now, these are the names of the ages. Read. First, the creative age. The creative age here, which, started, which, which was in the, the realm of eternity, or in the day. Because there was no time going on here in the creative age. Time did not begin until the transgression in the garden. And when that happened, that signal, when the sun went down in the, in the Garden of Eden, the, it also meant that the sun was going down on this creative age. See, and opening up the antediluvian, keep going. Second, the antediluvian age. The antediluvian age, or the age before the flood. That's what ante means, all right? And so the antediluvian age began in darkness because Adam and Eve were cast out and the sun had went down. So literally, they were cast into the outer darkness. Talking about Adam and Eve, all right? Continue. Third, the post-Diluvian age. Here's the post-Diluvian age. This is the age after the flood. Diluvian means flood. So this is the age after the flood that started. Yeah, after the flood. All right. The flood ended the first age and now began this age. Go ahead. The present. Okay, now this post-Diluvian age ended at Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection. See, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That ended the post diluvian age and opened up this present kingdom age. All right? Fifth, king, the kingdom. Now, the fifth is the kingdom age here. Now, that age will begin after the universal revelation of Yahshua Messiah. And we have the word Sabbath here and immortality, new earth state, and the seventh. Because the next dispensation that will happen in the kingdom age will be a sabbatical dispensation. See, or a Sabbath of immortality in the new earth state. All right? Now, that kingdom age will last until, read. The seventh, the sabbatical. Wait a minute, did you read six? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, six, I, did, yeah I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. Six, the perfect. Six, the perfect. Now, wait a minute. Now, somebody might get confused with that. I said, wait a minute. I thought you guys taught seven was perfection. It didn't say perfection, it said perfect. If you look up the word perfect, it means intact. In other words, we read that in Corinthians that all things will be put under his feet. In other words, all things will become under his feet and be intact unto him. See, perfect or intact. And then he himself, see, will be made subject to Yahweh so that Yahweh might be all in all in, in the what age? The sabbatical. In the, su the sabbatical dispensation, the seventh age. That's what we got over here. See, the rest. See, the seventh age. Then the eighth age, see, is him. Come, see, he's got to do that figure eight in principle. Then he comes out here. This is the eighth age or the beginning of a new set of ages. 
because the end is declared from the beginning. If he's appearing to Mount Elohim, appearing at the beginning of the ages, then you have to see him appearing at the end of the ages. Keep reading. Yeah, uh, the dispensations. Yeah, we may as well get them in since we're on this chart. Get them in here. First, mm -hmm. the Edenic. The That's what it says. Say that again. The Edenic. It says Edenic, but it should be Adamic. Well, it, well, well, not really. It could, it could go either way. You know, because, see, there was a thing about the transgression. Should we call it the Adamic transgression or the Edemic transgression? And see, and the way Dr. Kinley explained it, see, well, Adam, you know, he was in his disobedience. He was really being obedient to the purpose. See, but you would have a hard time trying to convince a Christian of that. See, but, but this Adamic dispensation is what's closed the creative age and opened the antediluvian age, the transgression, right? Now, that dispensation lasted until the next one. The second, the noatic. The noatic. With no, see, and look, and it's all through a man, Adam, Noah, okay? See, even though Adam may have died after 930 years, the prophet Enoch was, was translated into heaven. He was translated under the Adamic dispensation because Noah hadn't come yet. See, so the dispensation can outlast a person, okay? So now here come Noah comes along, and through him, the dispensation closed the antediluvian age and opened the post-diluvian age. And the Noahic trans, uh, dispensation lasted until the next? Third, the Melchizedek Abrahamic. Until Abraham received his promise and he was blessed by Melchizedek. That's how, even though Noah's dead and gone, but... That dispensation lasted until Abraham was called. See, and that, and that is called the dispensation of faith. That's why we have this down here. It says promise fulfilled. See, see, because he was told through his seed, singular, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And this is a dispensation of faith. And because we have this down here, it says promise fulfilled, and we are in the fifth and sixth dispensation, well, particularly the fifth, because that's what brought in the the, the spiritual kingdom on earth or grace, then you are saved by grace through faith. See? All right, continue. Fourth, the Mosaic law. All right, now that dispensation of faith lasted until Elohim spoke down the law from Mount Sinai. Okay? That was the dispensation of the law, the 613 ordinances. All right? That happened after Israel came up out of Egypt. See, when Egypt resurrected out of, e out of Egypt, they resurrected out of Egypt under the dispensation of faith, not the law, because the law hadn't been given yet. Right. See, that, why? That because it, port it portends your resurrection in this age. You come up out of Egypt, spiritual Egypt, death, burial, resurrection, by faith, through gr by grace, rather, by grace, through faith. That's what that's port, you know, that's why we go over it. Moses and the Israelites coming up out of Egypt so much because it's, it's pointing to you. Your resurrection out of Egypt. Continue, though. Fifth, the church or grace. Well, see, now that's the fifth dispensation. See, this is Pentecost, spirit law. The spiritual, assemb spiritual assembly, the body of Yahshua, spiritual kingdom on earth. All right, that happened here on the day of Pentecost. First to the Jews, then seven years to the Gentiles. Okay, go ahead. Six, immortality kingdom. Now, the sixth dispensation, this was brought in by Dr. Kinley. Let me go back here. Yeah, Abraham, Moses, here's the man here. The man here was Peter because he stood up in the day of Pentecost saying, well, you know, we're not as drunk as you suppose. Being only, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning here. See, the sixth, that's Dr. Kinley because he was the one that moved it over. And it's the sixth dispensation, which is likened to the sixth veil where the flesh is going to be rent in vain, in, uh, like a veil rent in twain. See, the, you know, and it's the sixth dispensation that's going to rent in twain, carry us into this age where this sabbatical will come in. But here, the sixth. See, you can do a lot of co co uh, correlations with this. The sixth step, like the veil. Uh, you can go back to the wilderness of Sinai about the manna being uh, poured out on them six days. And on the sixth day, 
they had to get a double portion because there was none given on the seventh. See, likewise here in this sixth dispensation, a lot of things are being poured out. Talking about knowledge-wise, see, as far as this gospel is concerned, for you to eat and consume. Because, look, in principle, if we're in the fourth age, then we have the fifth, sixth, and the seventh ages to go. That's three ages. That's likened to the children of Israel. Were they not told they had a three days journey? Were they not told that they, they had a lamb down in Egypt and they had to eat it with the loins girded and the shoes, you know, the staff in their hand, and to eat all of the, the lamb? And if you couldn't eat it, get some more folks to help you eat it because you had to be full of lamb when you come out of there because you weren't going to stop at Burger King or nowhere along the way. See, see, you had to be full of lamb. It's the same way here. You got to be full of lamb or full of the Holy Spirit because you got a journey to make. It's the same thing in principle. That's, that's why the doctrine is really it's very easy when you know the principle, especially when you know that these same principles repeat themselves over and over and over. Why? Because the manifestation may change, but the principle will always remain the same. Go ahead. Seventh, the sabbatical kingdom. This is the sabbatical, see, the seventh dispensation, the kingdom and immortality. That's why the word Sabbath is here. Not because they say, well, how is it a Sabbath in the fifth age? Well, it's a seventh dispensation. That's a sabbatical dispensation that we will be in in the new earth state, a state of rest. Okay? And see, and, and once that happens, see, and then, all, then Elohim will bring all things back to himself. And the sixth age is when he puts all things under his feet. And we in him puts on the garments of beauty and glory. And in the seventh age, that's when he goes back into Yahweh, all in all. And with us in him, presenting himself and us before the Father. Continue reading. The Sabbath is the day of Yahweh, now or the, the day. Now here, the Sabbath, right here. This is the seventh age. The Sabbath is the day of Yahweh. Read. Or the day before the beginning of the eighth or the beginning of another series of ages. Now, see, now, this is the Sabbath that's, that happens before the eighth, which is another series of ages. Seven ages have been completed. That's why this lampstand is lit. There are seven stars in his hand. He himself is the star by which he's going to be made manifest seven times. That's why up here, See, up here, you see these hearts up here. See, if I were to count them off, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It would appear like there's, oh, there's seven hearts up here. But it's not. It's just one heart who is Elohim being made manifested seven times. See, because he's transmuting, imparted to every aspect of the days of creation. Why? Because in the beginning, that's pointing to him being transmuted into every aspect of the seven ages. And here he is again at the end of the ages. See, completed. That's why he's fully dressed. In the beginning, he's nude. The reason why he's nude is because it's showing you that at the beginning, for us, the purpose was hidden in a mystery. But now here we are. See, we've gone through this. Gone through the fire. He said, bring me gold tried by fire. Well, we've gone through it. The lake of fire, the renovation of the earth. Gold tried in, gold tried in fire. And he's going to bring us before the Father. And then here he is here now, fully clothed, meaning that with that us in him, he is truly now fully revealed. Because it is true that we will be learning in ages to come. See, we'll be learning in the fifth age, the sixth age, and the seventh age. And here, at the beginning of a new set of ages, this is our graduation. Because here, we, will, we in him will determine what the next set of ages will be like. This is our graduation here. Say we're in school. No, this is the graduation. He and we in him, we have learned. And boy, let me tell you, I got some questions. I, I got some serious questions I would love to ask at this point. Because I remember Dr. Kidley saying that at this point, we'll be able to look back on these ages and see and understand more perfectly why Yahweh even created a set of ages. Why Yahweh even created a man. What the purpose of all this is for. And we also realize that there were ages before us. We'll know about them as well at this point, and we will know about the ages to come. Why? Because Yahweh is eternal, okay? Uh, let me see if I can get this star in here. 
I think it's numbers. I'm pretty sure it's, it's in numbers, I know. I'm, th I'm thinking maybe 23rd chapter, I'm maybe. Um, because that was fulfilled by Yahshua. Go see about the star of Bethlehem and all of that. Uh, numbers 24 and 15. Numbers 24, 15. Mm -hmm. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, had said, and the man whose eyes are open had said. He has said, which heard the words of El and knew the knowledge of the Most High, mm -hmm. which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nay. Now, there shall come a star out of Jacob, mm -hmm. and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. Okay, good enough. It says there shall come a star out of Jacob, see. Now that was, let me get, oh boy, 27. Thank you. I'll put you over here. Now, here, this is conception, birth, and flight. This is a, a downward plane because the story starts here where angel, uh, Gabriel is approaching Mary to let her know about her being pregnant. And here, the Holy Spirit here is overshadowing Mary or placing that seed within Mary's womb. Okay, so you draw a line. See, that's like, that's like uh, when they placed the, the second tables of stone that Moses had written into, placing it into the Ark of the Covenant here. Okay, now, here's going now with Mary. See, we're coming down here to the sixth step. What do we say about the sixth step? See, the sixth step is that there's an opening. There's an opening here at the River Jordan, right? So it's got to be an opening here. Mary's giving birth. Her matrix is opening, and she's giving birth to Yahshua. All right? And we're here in the holy place. Up here, it started off in Nazareth. And then they left from Nazareth and came down to Bethlehem. All right? Now, you can see the principles of light, bread, intercession. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. Well, see, that's likened it to the table of shoe bread, all right? And then <clears throat> the light, the star, see that star that the wise men follow, that was Yahshua. Because Yahshua, see, we, said, we read that he's the star. Well, where did that star come from? That's Yahshua astral projecting that star so that these wise men and, and all, anybody else who's supposed to see, they followed it. The star is Yahshua, see? And see, and what did they bring? See, you're talking about they brought, uh, they brought uh, myrrh and frankincense and gold. Why? Draw a line. Was some of the incense up here in the altar of incense? Wasn't it myrrh and frankincense? And weren't these articles made out of gold? See, see, all of these things are correlated. And said, so they said that he's the star. Here's the star here. Draw a line. Here's the stars up here. He's that star. But a seven of them, but he's being manifested seven times or through seven ages. See, the star is Yahshua, see. And then, you know, you can continue on. And then they had a dream. See, the spirit of Elohim, see, warned uh, actually what it was. See, it's the baby. See, it said the angel of Yahweh appeared to Joseph in a dream. Here's the baby here, astral projecting into Joseph's mind. They say, look, I'm here, you know, you need to get up from here and go down into Egypt. And see, and he's immersed in the dream to my Joseph. And so then they, you know, they pack up their bags, Joseph, Mary, and the baby, and they're going into Egypt under the penalty of death because Herod is looking for them. See, and then Herod kills the boy babies of Bethlehem. But anyway, but I'm just showing you the, the correlation because I wanted to draw out the thing about the star. The star is Joshua, see, who is Elohim. See, that's why I have these, that's why I talk about these stars, see, okay? And that's, that's just showing you a new set of ages. Are we still in the textbook? Yeah, let's finish reading that. I'll be almost finished. Hmm. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, I was letting you finish 
I was letting you finish your train of thought. Okay, all right. Go ahead and finish reading. The Sabbath is the day of Yahweh, or the day before the beginning of the eighth, or the beginning of other series of ages. It is necessary to mention here that Yahweh is eternal. Mm -hmm. It is also necessary that you do, as the Apostle Paul advised Timothy, study the scriptures to show thyself approved unto Yahweh, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the dispensations and ages. Mm -hmm. The word of truth, learn to correctly divide the ages and dispensations, mm -hmm. it must be remembered that all things visible and invisible abides in the realm of eternity. Okay, good enough. See, to learn how to divide the ages and dispensations, and really, they're illustrated on here. I mean, we go to the chart over there and you use the numbers, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. But they, they are illustrated. You can, s we just told you, this is the fifth age, this is the sixth age, the seventh age, this is a new set of ages coming up okay all right Chris what you got so earlier said that um, plate 4 in plate 38 um, in principle is the end being declared from the beginning and you took the principle of plate 4 in the holy place where it says where Yahweh gave the commandment to be fruitful and multiply how does that principle translate or correlate in plate 38 be fruitful and multiply? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because, go ahead. all right. Well, let's see here. Uh, he shall gather his elect from the four winds, I think. Where's that at? Also, <coughs> let's see how much time I got. Okay, let's, let's look, let's, let's do it this way. <coughs> get uh, Revelations, I think it's nine. I think it's nine. No, 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 not nine. Um, what, what, what was you saying? Yes, read that. Go ahead and read that. Where are you at? Uh-huh. Matthew 24. Can we hear you? Matthew 34 and 31. Oh, I told you 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the heaven with power and great glory. And, and he shall send his angel with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay. All right, that's one thing. I want Revelation 7 and 4. Oh, wait a minute. Start with uh, 7 and 1. Start with 7 and 1. Revelation 7 and 1. Uh-huh. And after these things, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, mm -hmm. that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim, and cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, mm -hmm. saying, hurt the earth, saying, hurt not the earth, uh -huh. neither the sea mm -hmm. nor the trees, till we have sealed the s servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousands of all the tribes of the children of Israel. All right, pause for a minute. Now let's go back here. All right. If you remember, six hundred and three thousand five hundred and fifty came up out of Egypt, talking about the fighting men. All right. Men, women and you know, not not including men, women and children. All right. They died out here because of unbelief. However, a new birth happened. 144,000, 12,000 per 12 tribes that followed Joshua, the son of Nun, into Canaan's land, okay? 
Now, I want you to jump down from there. It's the same, because uh, it goes through the number of tribes. Ninth verse. Seven and nine. Mm -hmm. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, uh -huh. of all nations, all kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and the palms in their hands. Okay, now John is looking back, and he sees Joshua bringing 144,000, the fighting men. And then he says he sees a number that no man could count. Draw a line. It's the same thing here. See, draw, you know, it's the same way because it's Joshua who's leading it. He's coming through the veil, see, and he's drawing that new birth out, see, that's been since the day of Pentecost, that new birth. And see, and, that, and a number that no man could counter, could count. All right, that was fulfilled by Yahshua the Messiah. Quickly, get Matthew, the fifth chapter. Maybe about the last two verses. No, not the fifth, the fourth chapter. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Uh, we'll follow him in the multitude? Yes. Uh, sorry, 20, 23. 23, 20. Matthew 4 and 23. Uh-huh. And Yahshua went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the glad tidings of Yahshua of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with the various diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with demons, and those which were lunatics, and those that were uh, par par paralytic, mm -hmm. and he healed them. 25, and there followed him a great multitudes of people mm -hmm. from Galilee, mm -hmm. from the Decapolis. Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. And from beyond Jordan. Now, when it says beyond Jordan, that means on this side of the Jordan, that they followed him across the Jordan into, into Canaan's land. That's a fulfillment of the people, uh, 144,000, following Joshua and Nun coming into Canaan's land. Over here, the New Earth State, it's going to be a number that no man could count, following Joshua into the Sabbath. It's the same thing in principle. See, and, see, and look, what number are you going to, because look, we're, we take the place, let's draw a line, we take the place of these that were kicked out, that one-third, it's one-third of an innumerable, right? So if it's one-third of an innumerable, then over here, we got to be innumerable because we're taking that place. So therefore, the number of souls here that's going up in here, it's got to be innumerable. The same thing in principle. So that's why I know it's got to be, a, it's, it's a, oh, can I put, how can I put this? It's, a, it's the offspring. That's part of the purpose of Yahweh, is to produce offspring. See? See, that's, that's why, yeah, that's why we got it up here. See, in the beginning, he's by himself, but here, the new kingdom, new earth, he's surrounded by his offspring, angels and souls alike. Because we're the same. Because we read in that one scripture, that John wanted to bow to him, he said, no, don't bow to me, we're the same. See, we're the same here, man. See, because souls of men made perfect will be likened to the angels in heaven, and we will be, we are his bride. See, and we in him, see, here, it will be revealed <laughs> the, the greatest mystery of all, who is himself and why he is doing what he's doing, and we in him will determine what will happen in the next set of ages, okay? I'm out of, we're out of time, and I'm sorry for taking you over, but I hope, th I hope that answered your question somewhat, did it? All right, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. All right, and so what we try to show, you see up here, and you can see it in the textbook, that Dr. Kinley takes these things to use and compare them to make his doctrinal points. But also, it also involves you taking the time to read the scriptures, because he did say this. You got a book, talking about a Bible. He said, you got a book. Try reading it sometimes. Now, everybody's read the Bible. You know, it's the most widely read book on the planet. But not everybody understands it. It's the least understood book on the planet. So it, it behooves the author of the book to explain himself to you. And the way he's explaining himself to you is by a divine pattern of the universe, which is the key into unlocking all these charts that Dr. Kennedy drew. And if you take the time and engage these charts, the charts will engage you and it will teach you. It'll show you, you know, it, it, you will become diminished. I must decrease and he in me 
must increase. And that's what all of us have to say, okay? All right, thank you for your time and your patience. Uh, for those watching, we, have, we thank you for, uh, for studying with us, and we invite you to come and study with us some more. We hope the things that you heard were edifying as well as enlightening, and we just simply ask you to read, research, and rehearse the matter. And the revelation, who is Yahshua Messiah, he will teach you all things, all right? Now, in closing, um, as always, be safe, be healthy, but most of all, be in Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because he most truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So this will conclude um, this afternoon, this morning session. We hold classes here every Tuesday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. and every Thursdays from 7.30 p.m. to uh, 9.30 p.m. and on Sundays from 12 a.m. to 12 noon, I mean 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, let us all stand to be dismissed. I'll be reciting the doxology taken from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.